We just left the station and there's already just kind of nothing but hard surfaces. Asphalt, we got sidewalks over here, we got construction right here, we've got an empty lot over there, more parking over there. We're kind of feeding into this loop of warmer days, warmer temperatures, and then with, with pavement and with um, buildings and concrete, all of that heat is absorbed and then that exacerbates the, the, the climate situation. There doesn't, there's nowhere for that heat to go, in other words. That's Nick Shruck, an environmental law professor at Detroit Mercy. What he's talking about is the heat island effect, and Detroit has some of the worst in the country. Concrete and asphalt are good at trapping heat from the sun, much more than grass. In one EPA study done at the peak of summer, pavement routinely hitting temperatures between 120 and 150 degrees. Compared to grass, which has been shown to be sometimes 40 degrees cooler than pavement. Part of the larger problem of having this very overdeveloped environment where we have, in many instances, a lot more pavement than we have people. Just basically downtown Detroit. And you can just see parking lot after parking lot. And most of them right now are empty. It's the middle of a day right now. So you'd expect these to be full with people working, even if people are working from home, but there are just so many empty lots. This map from the city of Detroit shows just how much of Detroit is pavement or hard surfaces that trap heat. More heat means more heat stress and sickness like heat stroke. A lot of grass, a lot of trees, good drainage. This is the opposite of downtown Detroit. A lot of experts like Vivek Shandas from Portland State University are looking at the effect of urban heat islands. In 2020, he conducted a study here in Detroit, and the results were alarming. We went out and collected 131,000 air temperatures over one day. That was morning, afternoon, and evening. And that allowed us to really describe in never before seen detail what the difference is from one neighborhood to another which ended up being about 11.5 degrees Fahrenheit. If you have a 95 degree place in the city, you have, in that sense, a 106 degree place in another part of the city. And then add on top of that, somebody living in a multifamily residential um, building who's on the third, fourth, fifth floor of that building, that temperature isn't 106 anymore. It goes up to 120, 125, maybe even 130 degrees in those upper floors of some of those buildings. But it's not just the heat, it's also flooding. All that hard surface also means water doesn't soak into the ground and instead flows into sewers, ponds, and the Detroit River, taking with it all of the chemicals and trash that collect in parking lots and streets. And that can lead to real harm, like little Zeus here, whose owners in Dearborn got a $10,000 vet bill after he got sick from floodwaters. Leptospirosis is a bacteria that comes from um, infected rodent feces. And unfortunately, because of all the flooding, it brought it into my backyard. It's very dangerous. It's dangerous to dogs. It, you know, it's life threatening. And it's also transmittable to humans. Okay, so I know the sick puppy was kind of a cheap shot, but it's not just puppies. It's people too. In 2021, the Michigan State Health Department tracked a 569% increase in Legionnaire's disease linked to floodwaters and runoff. That can cause all kinds of nasty lung and respiratory problems and it can be fatal. But there have also been some groups pushing to change course and tear up the unused or overpaved places. In Detroit, we have to grapple with the fact that we have 24 square miles of vacant land across the city and not all of that is gonna be built development. Some of it has to be green space. You know, I paid interest more so than just this whole end of stormwater management for what the de department was saying. One of those groups is Detroit Future City, an environmental group working on depaving Detroit. Those overpaved surfaces really heat up the neighborhoods that have less green space in them. And so depaving is one of the ways that we can help combat that and really fight against those issues that are becoming more prevalent because of climate change. 
The first project on Detroit's west side was at the St. Suzanne Cody Rouge Community Resource Center. And then the, the third thing they become um, is a wildlife habitat. Where Steve Wasco has been a lifelong parishioner, now a project manager. He volunteered to depave 7,500 square feet of unused parking lot. It has to um, help the economy of the parish. Turning it into green space. We sit right in a neighborhood. As you can see, there are houses on all four sides of us, and you don't see any fences in that. We're wide open, and we re really want to be an asset to the community for children to use the playground and for youth to use the basketball hoop and for others to come to the programs here. So anything that's more inviting, uh, broken up asphalt is not very inviting. That's just a small example of how depaving reshapes communities, but how much good it can do for the environment is even harder to tell because there aren't any big depaving projects anywhere in the country right now. There is some evidence depaving can work. In one EPA study, estimates show removing up to 10% of pavement from a city could mean as much as a seven degree drop overall. The difference between life-threatening heat and a pleasant afternoon. And in Portland, Oregon, what is thought to be the model for depaving, the group Depave Portland was able to reduce annual runoff by more than 15.8 million gallons since they started in 2009. But in the end, the idea really hasn't caught on. The big question is the scale. Like, is it having an effect on the whole neighborhood or is it having an effect on just that house adjacent to the place that's been depaved? That's a bigger question that we're still spending time scratching our heads over. But really, there's one big thing standing in the way, cars. What will keep us healthy? What are the assumptions we're using in building these cities? And can we find ways to cast and, and socialize the concept of green space as healthy and important for us to really um, kind of admire and hold up as something that went from a you know, car icon to a car and tree or green space icon, like we can hold those two things together. Solutionaries needs you to be part of the conversation. Your comments below will help us tackle new topics and track down solutions. And don't forget to subscribe.